which was good. Because yeah. so, five hundred space, he's gonna make that day. Do those uh, the 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 heated tapes work? Oh yeah, as long as they're plugged in, ready to go. You go down there and you feel it. It's not warm. Then it's not working. So it should be warm. We don't have anything that freezes in our house. We made sure of that because <laughs> in our old house we did. <laughs> so when we built the new house. We built it so that there would be <laughs> thing that was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, it's 7 o'clock. Good evening. It is 7 o'clock, and I'm going to call this meeting to order with five board members present tonight. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, mercy. Is there a motion to approve tonight's agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. That passes 5-0. We do not have a consent agenda tonight, nor do we have any comments from the public. So we'll move right on down to reports and presentations. And we have ORC presentation um, for Mr. Bruner. Good evening. Um, you have my report. Um, this is kind of our annual report we like to show you. Um, over to the left, you can see the program numbers for 2018 compared to 2019. Um, you can see our adult leagues are up. Um, those are your adult sports. Um, we do volleyball, softball, basketball. For the youth sports, you can see they're a little down right now, but this was done before all the youth volleyball registrations were in and we, all the youth basketball, they're still going on. So that's why those numbers are down right now. Pre-K programs, once again, we still don't have the tiny top basketball numbers in those yet. Um, our after school summer camps, uh, you see those numbers, our kid camp and camp shine numbers are, were up um, compared to last year. Um, EU, which is our after school program, those don't have all of October, November, December in there yet. Um, one of the neat things we've done this year with our after school program is we've partnered with the new bowling alley. So once a month or twice a month, instead of coming to the Gopper building, um, we kind of treat them and we take them to the bowling alley and they can bowl. Um, so the kids really like that. Um, so that's one of the neat partnerships that we got um, this year. Special event numbers, or you can see fitness, you can see that our numbers are up this year. Um, There's a couple new programs that we have in effect um, from previous years. One of the new ones is our new personal training program. Um, so people can some, come sign up for either one session or I believe it's three, four sessions. Um, and we can help them out in what they want to accomplish. One of the new classes is um, our Centrix classes, which is like a stretching class, fitness class that we've offered a new one. Um, and then one of the new ones also is it kind of started out um, with people coming to the Gop Pavilion last year. Um, it was what they called the Parkinson's group. Um, it's since evolved and we've taken it over. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays, one of the fitness classes is we call it Age for Action. Um, it's geared to, towards Parkinson's group, um, but it's kind of evolved into more of a class on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 11. Um, and we help them out with um, motor skills, motor activity, um, different exercises for them, different stretching exercises for them. Um, so that's one that's evolved from two people to now we see anywhere from 10 to 20 people there, depending on the day. So that's a new fitness class that we've offered. You can see our aquatic numbers there, um, swim lessons, pool parties, pool passes. Some of those are a little down. Um, the overall patronage was up. Um, the weather wasn't the greatest this summer. So that's why our outdoor aquatics classes and stuff like that were a little down. Um, you can see our path numbers there. Uh, PATH is our group for seniors, the workout group from Monday through Thursday, 9 to 10. Um, you can see we're probably going to surpass that number pretty quickly. We've seen those numbers um, increase as well. The attendance numbers there, um, you see the number of pass cards we've sold, but you can also see our daily attendance there. Um, so our daily attendance is up. Um, that does not include rentals or attendance for the programs. Those are just people coming in, walking working out upstairs, um, you know, we don't track those numbers, don't include if someone rents it out for a baby shower or a birthday party or if someone's coming for a practice there. You can see our rental numbers for the facility, um, they've increased by a lot there. Uh, we went from 55 rentals to 83 rentals 
as of October 14th there. Um, some of the other stuff there is our partnership with Ottawa Middle School um, for the intramurals instructional for volleyball, girls basketball, boys basketball. We still help them out with that. Um, they also, um, the partnership there, help us out on Saturdays during um, our youth basketball season for an extra gym. It's right there and close by if we need an extra gym for that, for our games. Um, our Lincoln Elementary partnership as well, um, utilization of the uh, their gym for either adult volleyball if need be, youth basketball or youth um, volleyball practices. Um, the Ottawa High School partnership there, um, we do have some of those students come over, um, a part of your, I believe it's your life skills class maybe. Um, they've been doing this for two, three, four years there and they'll come over in the afternoon, um, help us out, clean some windows, clean some equipment, do some laundry. Um, they'll help us out and they come over there. Um, also, on our end, maintain the fields for the baseball, softball for the high school. Um, I do want to point out with all three of these partnerships that um, the three main administrators that we work with, Kyle Cost, Austin Interest, and Brad Graff, um, they're all great partners to work with, whether it's the middle school, Lincoln, or the high school. They've all been great to work with over um, the years, and it's a great partnership that we have with all three of those. Uh, on the back there, you can see the American Legion Baseball, that's another partnership we have hosting their games. Uh, you can see the City of Ottawa partnership there as well, whether it be the baseball fields, the pool. One of the other things we um, included this year is with the City of Ottawa, the Ottawa Fire Department, they came over and helped our aquatic staff during the summer, um, help with some in-service training there. Um, it's a great partnership, they all get trained, but it's a great one to do some in-service um, in there as well. VA donations, one of the things we always like to mention is every, for the month of November, every year we collect new and used clothing. Um, they're at the GOP building, then we take it up to Topeka VA for our veterans clothing drive. That will start on November 1st here, so we'll be accepting that. Um, last year, we took three trucks, right, Ray? Yeah. Last year was the biggest one yet. We took three truckloads up there. Um, so it's something to give back as well. Um, some awards here this past week or two, whenever it was, um, we were voted the best community gym fitness center from the best of the best, as well as best customer service for the Ottawa's best of the best, Ottawa Herald's best of the best. Um, some community outreach we do. Um, we do have two ORC representatives on the Play City Task Force. Um, helps with the community play day. This year we helped with the team park back to school bash as well as the team park agility course build. Um, we do have two ORC representatives that are part of the Franklin County Children's Coalition helping with the spring fling there. Um, we do have one ORC representative that's a part of the Franklin County Pathways Committee. We do also have one ORC representative that's on the Chautauqua Days Committee, helped bring back the Chautauqua Days um, here on July 4th. Community events and participation, uh, participate on day of the job. We've participated on the CIS Future <coughs> Finance, the Team Park Back to School Bash, some of the other miscellaneous there. Um, give support and help with the car show, the tractor show. Um, you can see we've hosted some parts of the day on the job, home and garden show, quilt show. Um, after prom. One of the things we like to highlight too is during our summer camps we've grown it from just operating in one building to having many partnerships. So we partner with Camp Chippewa so a couple of days during our summer camps they can go out there, um, go canoeing, go hiking, do all that kind of stuff. Uh, we've also partnered with OMA. This is the third year we, third year we did that. Um, we try to think outside the box on this so what we do with OMA is at the beginning of the summer a couple of days a week we go over there um, and the kids can learn to play. And at the end of the year, they can, or at the end of the summer, they do a play production for their family, anyone in the community wants to come. So they do everything from learning to play, to helping with the lighting, to building the props. Um, so it kind of gives them something that they might not be, uh, get to experience before. Um, Ottawa Library as well, Fusion Alley. I'm a partner there with the fire department as well. Uh, some of the new programs we have, Kind of mentioned some of these personal training, fitness consultations, the eccentrics class, um, the age, age for actions class. Um, we did do a frisbee fest this year as well, um, which was a couple big disc golf tournaments in conjunction with Auto City Play Day. Um, I was talking to Dr. Cobbs there uh, last week, and we all one of the new programs we also did is a how-to series, 
last Friday was the first day we started it, but we kind of went off of your guys' um, school calendar and some of the days you guys had off. We try to offer what we call how-to series. So the first one last Friday was kids, teens could sign up um, when it was like um, dealing with cars. So we taught them or we had a mechanic come in, make sure they knew how to check the air pressure in a tire, make sure to air up a tire, check the oil in a car, what do all the indicators mean. Um, we're doing an outdoor one as well, um, as well as a finance one. So we're trying to think outside the box here on some of that stuff. Um, some of that's not on there, but one thing I wanted to say is we do employ quite a bit of USD 290 students, um, whether it be our grounds crew, um, our aquatic staff that can be lifeguards, cashiers. They work their way up to managers, um, officials, youth and adult, um, our after school program. We have one young lady who helps with our after school program right now, um, as well as our front desk. We normally have two to four of them that come to us for our front desk that are from USD 290. Currently, we have two right now that are USD 290 students. Um, so yeah, those are our program numbers as well as rental numbers and all of our community partnerships. Uh, on the youth sports, that's uh, about a 22% drop from last year to this year. What do you think are some contributing factors to that? I would say some of that has to do with traveling league. That's going to be part of some of it. Um, some of it is because some of those numbers aren't quite in there just yet. Um, one of the things we've tried to do, for instance, with our, um, we'll take baseball and softball because that was the first one that came to mind. Um, because the traveling leagues are some of the issue there, um, we try to give those students or those kids that play our sports an opportunity to travel as well. So even though they're the rec base, they can go play West Franklin or Princeton, um, Osawatomie, Lewisburg. Um, and we, what we've seen is we kind of branched that out too with our flag football is another good one. West Franklin, Williamsburg, some of them came in there. So we're trying to get them experience as well. Um, but I would say those were, that's going to be one of them is travel ball as well as some of the numbers, some of our stuff isn't in there quite yet. Any other questions or comments for Mr. Brunner? Thank you so much for all that you do, um, especially with your work as liaison uh, with our different staff at the schools and administration at the schools. And thanks to you and the board for um, making this such an integrated part of our community. There's obviously, you know, ORC is related to so many different facets of that. And I think that's fabulous. So thank you so much. And thank thanks you. for coming to present to us. Chad, as always, I appreciate our partnership as well. Thanks for coming in tonight. Thank you. Appreciate you. <clears throat> all right. We are moving on to section 5.02, which is our audit presentation um, from Mr. Mays. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, if you have the, I guess you have it up there. Uh, the uh, audit report um, is on page, or at least it's our part of the audit. Um, it starts after the table of contents and it's our uh, opinion on the financial statements. First, we tell you what we're auditing, which is the school district. Also, that manages responsibilities to make sure that uh, the financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with Kansas Municipal Audit Guide, uh, which is a little different than generally accepted accounting principles. And then we go into what our responsibility is as far as expressing an opinion on the financial statements, providing audit evidence by uh, 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 confirming, uh, testing, uh, looking at internal controls, inquiries, uh, analysis, that type of thing. Uh, based on that, we do feel that we have enough evidence to give you an opinion. And because this is a matter of public record, um, there at the bottom, the third paragraph down, we have to say you're not in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. You guys already know that. But and a reader who is not familiar with these financial statements needs to be identified that they are not in accordance with general accepted accounting principles. In fact, if they were, we'd have an adverse opinion, which is what's down there at the bottom of the page. Um, but what you're really more interested in is the top of the next page where you say we have an unmodified or clean opinion <coughs> on the regulatory basis of accounting, which is what you opt into each year. Uh, and that's what the majority of municipalities, both school districts, uh, cities, counties across the state of Kansas um, do opt into the Kansas Municipal Audit and Accounting Guide. There's quite a bit of information that appears back in the back behind the footnotes, and we have to give an opinion on that. Uh, but it includes your 
schedules for um, comparison to budget to um, detail more detail um, on each fund as for our what the revenues and expenditures were and how that compares to budget in the prior year and also shows your agency fund which is basically the funds at the activity level at the sc each school and based upon that we feel that they are also fairly presented uh, because of the amount of funding that you have the second to last paragraph states that basically there is another opinion here uh, that opinion is on uh, back at the back, and it uh, basically is on governmental auditing standards because your federal funding is more than $750,000, and we'll get into that when we get back there. And then a lot of, uh, basically, again, back in the back is a lot of detailed information, including comparison to prior year. So we tell you that we actually um, did the audit for prior year and that that financial statement um, are in last year but we feel that they are fairly stated in accordance with last year and also in accordance with what we did this year so turning to page three and four you get to see a summary of cash receipts and expenditures and unencumbered cash so basically this is the detail this is the detail by fund but each fund is basically summarized in terms of uh, what the beginning cash was, unencumbered cash was what receipts are expenditures etc General fund, um, as you can see, is uh, sitting at zero as far as unencumbered cash. It did have a number of payables and encumbrances at year end to bring that cash balance up to 546,000. Uh, but um, basically the way the state has things working uh, for the last, I don't know, several years, uh, you really want that fun un unencumbered cash to be at zero because any carryover on that reduces your funding for next year from the state of Kansas. So whatever that dollar amount is, if it's a dollar or if it's $500 or $500,000, it reduces the funding for the next year. So anyway, I'll get into a little more detail about that when we get back to the back. Um, just real quickly, if you turn to page five and six, you get to see the rest of the funds and you're gonna see that the unencumbered cash at the beginning year was 18,700,000. At the end of the year, it was 16 million. Uh, well, 16 million, almost 100,000. It went down quite a bit, but that's really to be expected when you have capital projects in which you're now um, in the latter phases of, of those capital projects, and therefore the money has actually came in earlier um, in terms of bond issues, and now it's going out, and that's where your biggest drop was uh, in terms of uh, the cash um, was in the construction fund. Now flipping back a little bit, I did talk, I want to talk about some of the other funds that changed some, <coughs> capital outlay, also went down about 200,000, a little over 200,000, and most of that was due to the f year before. There was quite a bit in miscellaneous receipts, and there wasn't near as much this year. And also, you um, expended quite a bit out of instructional and function uh, facility expenditures. They were up quite a bit compared to the year before. Special education is another fund that went down about 251,000, and basically, that was. Uh, Due to, due to the receipts were actually up, but you had a, quite a bit of expenditures in that one, which the ultimate result was that it went down. Uh, contingency fund went from 1.7 million to 2 million. Uh, basically, it's um, up due to transfers from the general fund. It also had a transfer out to the textbook fund. Uh, which is the next one that changed quite a bit, and it uh, it shows that transfer of about 300,000 into it, but it also had quite a bit of new textbooks that have bought this last year, so that's why it went down overall by 132,000. On pages five and six again, uh, another fund that's uh, that's up from the year before is your bond interest fund. It's up about 518,000 dollars, and really the receipts were about the same for this, this current year, or the year that we're doing the audit for, uh, what was down is basically the payments on the bonds. Um, it's one of those, as we get back in the footnotes, you're gonna see it kind of goes up and down, and I think next year it goes back up again as far as what's owed in principle. So um, you kind of might expect it if the, if the receipts to stay the same that uh, that fund will actually go back down again. And we already talked about what happened with the uh, construction fund. Um, as, as the projects continue to wind down, you're going to see more and more of that. In fact, um, 
you had uh, only 697,000 of money that hadn't been encumbered yet. But if you look at the encumbrances, they were 5.8 million, uh, leaving the cash balance of 6,500,000. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time on, on that particular fund because of the dollars that are involved there and, and looking up and making sure that those encumbrances make sense. And just to kind of clarify an encumbrance compared to a normal business, a normal business would have, if they had a contract with a construction company, they would record as expense what they owed at the end of the year uh, for that particular uh, project. So if it was a million dollar project and the construction company had actually done, actually done $200,000 worth of work, that's all they would recognize is $200,000 in payables. Um, under the encumbrance method, the whole million dollars gets recognized because you're obligated um, as of the end of the year to eventually pay that all out. So. Um, there's quite a bit of work to do yet, yet at the end of that year, but a lot of it had already been done. I'm just trying to clarify as to why that number is, is so large in terms of the uh, uh, encumbrances. Um, getting into the footnotes, I'm not going to talk too much about the first part because it's basically about uh, someone who's not as familiar with the district, um, how you do your funding and how you're uh, doing your accounting. Um, but if you turn to if you turn to page 10, you can, can see the capital projects from the standpoint of uh, expenses paid by year starting in 15, 16, and how they've increased each year um, till, um, till this next year. And this is actually the, the, the payments going out, so uh, it doesn't include that, i.e., the part of the contract that the contractors aren't done with. On long-term debt, uh, it starts on page 10, but the more important part is probably on page 11 where you get to see that you had, uh, at the beginning of the year, this is what you owed was 80 million, and you paid 1.1, 1 .1, uh, almost 1.2 million out, so you owe 79 million, uh, 600,000. And then if you go down a little bit uh, to about the middle of the page, you're gonna see how that pays out. In 2020, you got 40, thousand dollars worth of uh, principal that you're going to pay but then it jumps up to hundred and or one million nine hundred thirty thousand the next year just on that series 12 and some of the rest of them don't come into play well 2013 they actually pay 1.6 million next year and then it kind of drops down to zero for a while and comes back up afterwards so there, th there's going to be a lot of kind of up and down as far as that bond fund I go it goes over the next few years I believe but it does have a good healthy cash balance at the present time. Page 14, um, there is one new footnote in here. Um, it's not overly significant, but I did want to bring it to your attention. It's about, uh, well, it's a third paragraph on page 14, and basically it's talking about the 1% uh, under the CAPERS plan. It's for insurance. Um, um, long-term disability and life insurance and the fact that that is a, another plan that's out there that some of your employees are in. Then we get into defined benefit plans, the CAPERS, and um, on page 15, um, as we've talked about in the past, they want to spread out this liability. So basically they're saying that uh, you owe $23,434,839. Again, there is a ton of calculations that go into that. Um, it's assuming that person A is going to come to work for you, that they're going to work for you the entire time that they're here, when they get done, that they're going to um, live to a certain age exactly, and then they better pass away or else <laughs> with the way they calculate it. Uh, so anyway, there's, there's just a lot of things that go into that. And, uh, it, of course, it's... Um, the biggest problem with the CAPERS fund is that the state keeps playing around with it. And the paragraphs before that on page uh, 14, you can see that on two occasions they've decided to underfund it. And then they decided that they would make up that underfunding over a 20-year period. Well, that's the problem with that is people are drawn out. Well, they haven't put all their share back in because of what they haven't put in. And then they turn around and actually nix that as far as what they're going to put in uh, on those payments. Um, they've redone that two or three times. Um, page 
eight, uh, 19 and 20. One of the things nice about the K Mag is it gives you a number of summaries. The one up front taking you by showing you all the detail of fund, but then taking you back to uh, just showing you the broad category receipts and expenditures. Here on uh, page 19 and 20, one of the things the state wants to see is that you stayed within your budget categories. Uh, so what you expect to see is either a zero or a bracket in that far column where it says variance over under budget. Uh, if it's over budget, that's a budget violation would actually have to be pronounced, uh, pronounced in the footnotes as to, as to why that happened. A couple of the columns that might not make quite so much sense is, uh, well, the first one is certified budgets, but you're the ones that spend most of that time working on and getting the numbers down. The next one is over as the state saying, well, you did what, you're, you did what you want, but this is what it's going to be by them telling you that they're reducing your budget by uh, 600000 in the general fund and almost 200000 in the uh, supplemental general. And then we have what we call budget credits and basically anything that wasn't budgeted for in terms of revenue, so federal grants, reimbursements, uh, donations, that kind of thing, ends up actually being a budget credit back. So that gets added back and that's how we get to the numbers we do as far as what the actual budget number is compared to the actual expenditures. Page 21 and 22, you have the general fund. And as I, as I said, it comes to zero, but uh, how we got there was that basically cash receipts were up. You did have more state aid coming in. Uh, it went from 15, 7, 15,700,000 to 16,400,000. So it was up good there. Um, but overall, it was a, a um, zeroed out by the fact that the salaries and instructional was up about 619,000. And then the next biggest thing that went up was the special education uh, uh, transfer over to it. It was up 207,000. So those two together <coughs> um, resulted in you being up um, about $720,000 in expenditures. So the money that came in went right back out again in the general fund. Which I should say, Harold, was the state's expectation in giving more money. Right? That's what they wanted to see. That's what us. they wanted to see, yeah. Uh, supplemental general, uh, really there wasn't a significant uh, change in the overall. Um, we had 5.1, almost 5.2 million in receipts last year, and it's 5. Point almost 2 million, or 5,200,000 again this year. And your expenditures, i.e., are about the same. Uh, so your general, or your supplemental general fund went down some uh, compared to the year before, but not, uh, not a huge amount. All the other funds, uh, really we're not talk about too much because basically there, there wasn't any significant changes or we've already talked about them in terms of the fact the capital outlay had additional expenditures this year, taking up some of the slack from the construction fund on stuff that it didn't cover, textbooks being up, um, et cetera. If you turn to page, let's see, page 59 and 60, the you know, reason for showing you this is this is the activity funds at the school level. And the interesting thing about it is you turn to page 61 and 62, you actually get to see the totals. And wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I take that back. On page 60 is the uh, beginning cash is 160000 end of the year at 152000 Well, um, that's quite a bit of cash, but nothing compared to what the other funds were. But it almost had uh, $410,000 receipts and $416,000 worth of expenditure. So it's interesting that there's quite a bit that runs through those activity funds. Um, page 61 and 62, which I started to mention, are actually the funds out at the school level that actually belong to the, to the uh, district. Um, you, they're district monies, um, as with athletic uh, fees and that type of thing that have been collected, but not actually brought back into the, to the main office. They're actually sitting out at, the, at these school districts, or at the school buildings. Page 63, you're required to have an audit, statutory basis wise. So even if you didn't have a lot of federal funding, you'd still have to have an audit. But um, you also get brought into that by the fact that you have um, over $750,000 worth of uh, expenditures in uh, federal grants. And yours was $2,028,900 uh, this last year. So 
That's the reason why, and we spend quite a bit of time in terms of compliance testing and auditing on those grants, uh, which is a requirement by the federal government. Page 66 and 67 um, required us to give a, an audit opinion based on governmental auditing standards, which are a little bit different than generally accepted auditing standards, which is what we would do no matter what. Um, and basically they want us to look a little bit more at internal controls in terms of the financial reporting and compliance um, overall. Their, their idea of compliance would be making sure that you're making your um, deposits uh, appropriately on um, your, f your federal and state withholdings, that type of thing, that kind of compliance. So um, we, we did those tests and based upon those tests we feel that there is no significant deficiencies and material weaknesses that need to be disclosed. Um, you're going to say, well, it's kind of negative. Well, that's the best we can do because uh, we base it on a, a sample size um, as we're testing these, which means we don't look at every transaction. And for us to be positive and say there are none, we would have to look at every transaction. So that's the reason why the wording's that way. Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a good, clean opinion on governmental auditing standards. And page 68 and 69 actually focus more on the federal grants that we look at, and we rotate those around each year. Um, this year we looked at the basically the special ed um, monies that we're going through in detail. It doesn't mean we ignore the other ones, it's just we spend more time and more detailed tests on those particular grants. And then we have to give you an opinion as to whether um, you had internal controls that, that, um, that seemed to suffice and get, get you where you needed in terms of compliance with the federal grants and also that you're in compliance with the federal regulations and on both of those we've given you a clean or unqualified opinion on those. And last but not least, the last page, um, you saw how much the state like to have things summarized Well, the federal government the same way because you're going to see on this back page we basically tell them in detail um, what type of opinion we gave in accordance with GAAP, which again was adverse, but only because you're not doing it in accordance with GAAP. Um, and also that you had an unmodified or clean opinion on uh, your financial statements when they're looking at it in accordance with the regulatory basis or the KMAG basis of accounting. Um, we also indicate that there was no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies um, in terms of overall and that we felt that same way in terms of the internal controls and compliance with the federal awards which are listed there. Then we have to identify what the major programs are. So we give them a detail of what we, how much we tested and we tested, again, we looked at special ed, we also looked at Title I. Uh, so we looked at detail, um, one million, of uh, the two million and the other ones uh, basically as we run across expenditures we have to kind of go back through the uh, process to make sure that they're also in compliance so if we pulled them any other way we have to look at them that way too um, as I indicated the dollar threshold um, is 750,000 what they mean by A and B programs is basically you're just putting it in a bucket. If it's 750000 it's a type A program. If it's a type B program, it's under 750000 Then we have to pick so many type A's and type B's based upon the risk assessment. Um, you know, how long you've been doing the program to uh, whether the federal government itself considers it to be a, ri a higher risk. And generally speaking, when you have eligibility requirements, it's usually a little bit higher risk. And we did food service last year, which is eligibility required, but we didn't have any findings. So that kind of reduces it to a low risk. So that's the reason we have to rotate to another program. And your last but not least, it says audit qualified as a low risk audit T, and it says no. Um, due to the federal government, like I think it was two or three years ago, deciding that if you have an option to have a regulatory basis or a gap basis and you decide to take the regulatory basis, you can no longer qualify as a low risk auditee. Mm -hmm. So all the school districts across the state of Kansas that accept, um, take in the Kansas Municipal Audit Guide as their reference for accounting are subject to this same thing. It, you'd have to have a gap basis and then you'd have to have it for at least two years and you'd have to have no findings in those two year period too. So. 
um, you're doing the you're doing the best you can um, with the, the system that you selected and I think we've talked about K mag versus gap before and uh, uh, gap has its place I won't deny that but um, sometimes it's built up a little bit too much from the standpoint that I said well it makes you it makes it so that you can compare your financial statements to a school district in New York well I'm sorry but that's a bunch of baloney because there's no real comparison you know they're gonna have thousands of students in some of their schools they're gonna have 10 times the number of buildings, you know, this type of thing. Uh, so to say that they're comparable really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and under a KMAG, uh, basically, if you look at the financial statements, what you're gonna see is you know how much cash you have left and how much is available to be spent um, either on paying the payables that have been, that are there or what's going to be available for the next year, which is a very conservative basis of accounting. Um, and uh, your, your bonding agencies have all thought that, you know, it's nice to know because that's what they're interested in. They want to know, they want to know what you um, have left to pay the debt with. They don't care the fact that you build a brand new school because you can't use that to pay the debt anyway. Nobody's going to come and pick up a brand new school. So. That's what I have. Any questions? Well, Harold, I think uh, you do a fantastic job every year coming in and, and showing us how we did the, the previous year. And I think that's uh, a, a great factor for how well we run our district. And uh, to Terry and her, her group and how well we kind of budget everything, as well as our building administrators and, and uh, our district administration and keeping the budget in check. Um, so thank you for showing the public kind of where we're at for last year and, and that we're, we're still doing okay. Yeah, still doing okay. Like I said, you know, if, if you were looking at a for-profit business and you'd suddenly say that cash dropped $2 million, you'd say, oh my gosh. But the reason why is you're doing with the money what you're supposed to do and that money really isn't there for any other purpose than doing that. And once you've completed that purpose, the money's gonna be gone, so. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank uh, you, Harold. One other thing I would like to add is, is that I, I con uh, congratulate or con um, want to speak highly of, of you uh, as, uh, as part of the board from the standpoint that this has got to me at sometimes a very frustrating process to go through all the hoops to get a budget that you think is going to work only to have the state tell you that it's different. <laughs> it, it just, <laughs> that, just, that just blows me away every year because it's like, you know, you're the ones that are running it. You know what's going to go on, and yet they turn around and tell you, no, you're going to change it. And I've done auditing in, for school districts for a lot of years. I've never seen that be a positive number where they've increased it. It's always been a negative number. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. All right, we are uh, moving on to section 5.03, board reports. Who would like to start? Uh, you know, I thought the wall of honor went really well. Um, it was good to see uh, some of the former inductees and always good to chat with them and, and, and learn about some of the great things they've done. Um, I'd like to congratulate the three inductees that uh, were inducted this year, so well deserved. Anyone else have anything to share? I went to the middle school site council. Uh, I think our, our one of our big issues is trying to find a place big enough for that class to have graduation. Uh, it's a big class, 225 kids, so oh. I don't know if uh, Mr. Soltenberg's found a place yet, but we had some just as a, a means of comparison if you're struggling to to try to figure out exactly what an additional 30 students looks like think about typically we have about 180 some odd students that go through promotion and that place is packed to the gills mm -hmm. so not only are you talking about adding another 30 students but you're probably talking about adding another 200 parent or or other family member um, group that is far more capacity than that gym 
can hold. So uh, we have several conversations going on right now in terms of, of where we might be able to, to house uh, a promotion this year for eighth grade, one of which would be um, the OU Chapel. Uh, it was a place where, where we've had promotions in the past, uh, way back in the late 80s and early 90s, I believe that most of the eighth grade promotions were there when the, when the building was downtown and there wasn't a space uh, for that. But there have been some remodeling done at, at the OU Chapel. I don't know that the seating arrangement is the same as it used to be in terms of its capacity. So uh, we'll continue to look and monitor and find the, the best uh, opportunity for us for eighth grade promotion this year. So we can make sure that everybody can see it live and we don't have to have groups that are sitting in a, a place where we're streaming the event and not be able to be a part of it with their families. And yes, the pack will not hold that many people. So that, no. that's out. No. Yeah. I mean, the other option, which I'd, I'm really not a big fan of, would be splitting the, the graduating class in half. But I'm not a big fan of that because they've all worked together to get there and they should be promoted together. But an option. Anyone else have any reports? Um, I went to the OHS site council meeting on the 17th and Mrs. Whitaker discussed with us uh, the ACT scores which have gone up over the last year, uh, the positive response to the cyclone hour that is happening, and then uh, looking forward to student-led parent-teacher conferences in the spring, which is something different that the high school is doing. Um, which should be exciting to see. Um, I also went to the Wall of Honor Banquet and Brian was there, Linda was there, Shanda was there as well. Um, and uh, we certainly welcome the new inductees, uh, Mr. Dietz and Mr. Cohen and Mr. Uh, Kissinger. Um, I think that was about it. So. All right, up next we have um, an item that we do need to take action on, which is 6.01 Eugene Field logo presentation. Uh, Dr. Copps. You guys have seen this several times through the updates. The importance of this stems from um, the building at Eugene Field continuing to be an overall building of Eugene Field and not not being the piece that, uh, that it tends to be recognized now, which is Engage. It actually houses all of our alternative programs and also oversees um, the program at the Juvenile Detention Center, which is mandated by the law at this point, um, considering that we house the facility there. It's something that we have to, to accommodate and provide. We also have our adults program there. We have the Ottawa Learning Center, which is our alternative school there. We have the Ottawa Virtual Learning Program there, and we have Engage that is housed there. So a lot of different programming, totaling um, well over 100 students uh, throughout the year, uh, that work through this building and part of what it is 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 really as you see in the in the logo there it is about creating new beginnings for those kids making sure that we provide them with the knowledge the skills and the behaviors in order to be successful in life moving on from there but this gives a unity to the entire program and the entire building that is Eugene Field and all of the programs that work within it instead of individualizing each one of them and creating a silo for each individual program any discussion? Who created the logo? So I believe it was Miss Briggs, right? It was Sally Mongold, a senior at the high school. So she, Mrs. Briggs collaborated with the kids in Mrs. Fisher's class, and ultimately, I believe it was Sally Mongold who finalized the logo. Yeah. And then she was the one who created the logo for the high school. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, revitalization projects totaling I think about 20 different addresses. Um, the commercial pieces you will recognize as uh, M&M Sports Shop downtown, which is, I believe, on 3rd Street, um, as well as the, the building on 401 South Main, which is uh, Josh Walker's building that is getting ready to open up this week, which would be fantastic. Uh, and then there are a number of homes, uh, both for renovation and new construction listed there as well. The, the reason that the school is asked to approve this is because ultimately it affects our taxation and the amount of money that comes into the district. Ultimately, what it means for us is that, yes, we will see a slight decline in taxes, but over the course of time, as we see improvements to these, uh, to these um, homes and, and uh, different dwellings, then we will see an increase in valuation because of their increased property value. So in the end, it actually benefits us quite a bit to go ahead and approve the Revitalization Act proposals. Do these need to be presented separately or can we do them all as one? I think you can approve them all as one. Yep. Any discussion on these or questions? Okay. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move we approve the Neighborhood Revitalization Program for renovation, commercial, and new dwellings. Second. Okay. All in favor, raise your right hand. That passes 6-0. I actually think that uh, Mr. Wingert sits on this board, I believe that it's correct. You yes. Um, and I think you guys are meeting tomorrow we again are. to discuss additions to the revitalization program, which again would be, I think, welcomed by school district as well as we see those. We'll put them back on the agenda yeah, for There were a lot on this one, more than I've ever yep. seen. Yeah. Uh, I think well, the city came out early last week and said I think there were 65 houses uh, in our community that were deemed blighted uh, without anybody living in them. Um, so there's a, a great opportunity for us to do some things through the Revitalization Act that would not only benefit our community as a whole because of the blighted projects that we have, but also because of the lack of housing that we have available within our community. Not everything has to be a new dwelling all the time. We do have some opportunities that exist here within some renovations. All right, we're going to move on to 6.03, um, the first read of the PAC handbook, and this item is just for discussion tonight. Yes. Yeah, so We've got a lot of work yet to do, but I uh, did want to bring this up and, and show that, one, we are starting it. So you got to see uh, the beautiful Performing Arts Center tonight, and it is absolutely beautiful, um, and it is a, a spectacle to behold. There are going to be a lot of things that we need to make sure that we have a, a grasp on prior to treating this like any other, um, any other part of the district facilities. Um, so all of our district at this point has access to the public. If you'd like to rent it, you can fill out a facility usage form and you can rent any part of our facility as it stands. Um, what we want to make sure that the, that the Performing Arts Center is something a little bit different. One, it's a nine to $10 million building. It's incredible. There are a ton of electronics in it that cannot be utilized by just anybody that there are hours worth of training that has to go into uh, being able to utilize those controls appropriately. And we want to make sure that we have training in place for those groups that continue to utilize them um, and that, that anybody that were to utilize that space from a public standpoint would have to employ the services of those people to make sure that not just anybody comes in and starts messing with different sound systems, light systems, all of those things. So this is a start to the processes that we want to put into place in terms of how the facility can be utilized. I think we want to be very upfront that as much as we don't know about the Performing Arts Center um, at this point, that we, we would not put it up for public use until after the 1920 school year and we have a quality grasp on how all of the different aspects of the center work. Um, from the lights to the sound to the walls to the to the curtains to the lobby area there are just a lot of different technical issues um, that exist within the performing arts center that we want to make sure that we know very well we also want to get a real grasp of how often that center will be used solely for usd 290 activities and as we've already started a google calendar it is filling up very quickly um, we know that we will want to do elementary programming there. We know that we will want to do middle school programming there, and certainly we will want to do high school programming there. 
those things begin to fill up very quickly and making sure that we have the ability to do them within the within the confines and constructs of the day that we have available to us how we work with those schools to come over and do sound checks to get kids used to performing on a stage like that versus you know you take a group of of third graders and they're used to performing in the gym on some risers it's very different walking into the performing arts center and and going through um, what it would take to perform there as well as understanding where to go when you get there there's a lot of things a lot of learning that has to that has to take place one of the questions that that apparently came to you all with a, with regard to the performing arts center was who will oversee its calendar usage and do we have the capacity to to do that without adding resources um, I think the answer to that question is yes. I think it exists within our current structure that we're able to do so. Um, but the person who will oversee that will be the activities director um, at Ottawa High School. So for the remainder of this year, that will be Mr. Graff. Um, and again, those will solely be USD 290 programs that go in there this year. Um, and for years to come, it would be whoever fills that role uh, as Mr. Graff uh, retires and and does whatever retired people do next year um, <laughs> I, maybe he'll run for school board at some point in time we'll see we'll see what happens um, but the the reality in terms of whether it creates additional workload um, really comes down to when 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 we when we look at this year as being solely USD 290 events that workload already exists within our system it's it's nothing new um, the AD at the middle school, Mr. Cost, is already doing a number of those things. Mr. Graff does them all at the high school for now. The principals do them all at the elementaries. So there's somebody that is already carrying that workload. The only thing that they're going to have to look at now is within that calendar, where does the date fit? So elementary principals uh, will be responsible for supervising the events in the PAC when they come over. They will work closely with high school staff. If we need to bring kids in, how do we shut off that area for elementary kids so that high school kids aren't, um, aren't infringing upon their time within the center? Um, middle school, same way. We'll have Mr. Cost and um, our, our instructors there take on some of those responsibilities. We do want to make sure that those administrators are available to be uh, the supervisors of those events. The Performing Arts Center will have so many things um, that our instructors will need to be uh, in charge and aware of that it is not it is not the intention of us to have them overseeing any of the other things. Take care of your kids, take care of the PAC. That would be the role of either the music director uh, band director or theater director utilizing that space and then the administration will take care of the supervisory aspects of of the building overall um, but again I think we can do this and for the first year we will know very quickly whether we can or we cannot with the resources that we currently have or if there will need to be adjustments to that as we move forward questions for me on the hand just to tell you the handbook we have been through it Mrs. Whitaker and I have been through it Lots of times. Um, Mr. Moore uh, with facilities has been through it with us. Um, there are a couple of things that we still need to address. Uh, the fire department still needs to come in and determine um, where, our, uh, where our shelter areas are. If the entire PAC can be utilized as a shelter area or if we are going to have to move kids back into the main building. Um, if there would be severe weather. Um, those things have just not been made public to us yet. So we'll, we'll work through the fire department, make sure that we have all of those things in place, make sure that it's spelled out very clearly in the handbook for the, for the Performing Arts Center, and that anybody that utilizes it would know exactly what they would need to do in terms or in, in the time of severe weather. Um, make sure that we keep everybody safe that might utilize the space. So this is a work in progress and, and it will change when all the what ifs are answered yes so this is not something we'll be we'll be voting on soon probably probably not still for a month month and a half maybe close to maybe in january we may bring it up again i wanted you to see it if there was anything that you might have have questions about for instance uh, harold brought up a question today about um, facility guidelines that we had mentioned in there Ultimately, those things are set. 
um, that is the facility usage form that we currently have. That form doesn't change with the PAC. The cost of custodians is the same. The cost of setup is the same. Those things still exist in the same format. We will adjust that document to fit the needs of the PAC, but, but those things aren't, the, the values that are there are not going to come back. It is not going to be uh, an outrageous cost to utilize the space. Um, but again, those things have always been determined um, with regard to if it benefits our kids, we've allowed usage of our space at either no cost or very minimal cost. The only thing that we try to offset is whether or not we have to use our custodial staff. We don't think it's fair that, that we have to pay for pickup and, and cleanup and setup of, of somebody else's event. And electrical things if we're going to have a ton of lights on it again we don't feel it's the district's responsibility to pay for that those are typically the things that we ask to be covered uh, when you have a, a, a rental of space from us it is not uh, any intent to be a money maker or any of those things we love our spaces we want our community to use our spaces we want them to respect our spaces and understand that there are lots of things that go into our spaces remaining as great as they are as they use this building, I, like when I talked about the what ifs, as this building is used, we're going to realize that, oh my gosh, we should have addressed this in the policy. Will this yep. policy sort of be a fluid document this first year? I would really like to see it be more like our strategic plan and that we are constantly modifying it okay. and really taking a look at, did this work, did it not work? Um, and we won't really know all of the ins and outs until we start allowing public usage of it. But we should know a heck of a lot more by the time that we get elementary groups in there, middle school groups in there. It's one thing when you have a, uh, an entity that is, that is attached to the high school and high school people can be very fluid moving in and out of it and we can work through some of those things. Something very different when you have to begin to cordon off a section of a school to allow outside usage and by outside usage I mean if Lincoln is coming over to do something, we want to make sure that all of those kids are secure in that space, that our students at the high school do not have access to them during that time, unless that access is warranted and granted, that we have kids working together, whatever it happens to be. Those things are very different. But if what we're talking about is that in the course of the day, they need a dress rehearsal for their fifth grade, whatever, then we can block that space off, make sure that they have access to the things that they need without high school staff being present to do it. How do we work with those with those kids that are going to be in charge of the sound system and the light booths and those things? How do we give them the opportunity to be in there during that time, possibly missing some instruction, but ensuring that things go off without a hitch within that performing arts center? It It is an incredible space and it will be utilized a, a ton. We want to make sure that we have everything in place that we need to not only continue to have it be an amazing space for this year and five years down the road, but for 20 years down the road and 30 years down the road, to have it still be the amazing space that it is today. I was, the only thing I was thinking about was um, someone brought a pet in today to the office and they had an accident or in my exam room. <laughs> Could do it in anybody else's. But anyway, be that as it may, I was thinking about donkeys at Easter and <laughs> Christmas and, you know, those type. Sure. I mean, I don't know. There isn't anything about animals. Uh, no, because. I know we have service animals. and Right. I mean, we have some policies about animals that exist in the building currently. Um, and we can we can refresh those and make sure. And I'm glad you brought it up because we probably need to be very explicit within this it policy. Says no it, food and drink. No animals. No food um, and drink and smoking. But so there's nothing about the the law would indicate that we have to allow service animals. Um, and that's something something very different. Um, but it does not indicate that we have to allow anything else. So we can make sure that we address the animal piece and be very explicit in our statement that animals are not allowed, the exception of service animals. And we can identify, I think it's under uh, ESSA that identifies what we have in there, or IDEA. So we'll, um, we'll provide that information in there and make sure that we have it very clear as to what our expectations are. But also, as you brought up, no food or drink would not allow food or drink in that space either. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Cobbs regarding the handbook or the PAC? 
right. We'll continue to keep this in front of you, and we'll utilize the board update again as we make changes and adjustments to it. We'll utilize that so that we don't always have to come into into this form to make minute changes, but uh, we'll continue to update as we find updates necessary to, to put in there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving down, um, we do need to have an executive session tonight to go over uh, the superintendent's evaluation. Um, we need to meet and then we need to have Dr. Combs come and join us. Um, after we have that completed, do we need to go into two separate executive sessions? Or? Yes. Okay. So the first one, I would say um, 15 minutes um, for the first part, and then we'll come back and go into the next one. If somebody would like to make a motion reading the uh, statement. Madam President, I move that the board go into executive session to discuss personnel matters pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception under coma and that the open meeting shall resume at 8 15. Okay, sounds good all right second all in favor raise your right hand that passes 6-0 board members please bring your completed evaluations or your blank form if you haven't completed it yet Is there a motion to uh, resume regular session? So moved. All in favor, raise your right hand. Passes Wait, 6 0. Was there a second? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Please second. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you. All in favor, raise your right hand. <laughs> that passes 6 0. Oh, you have to sit down. So um, uh, we do need to return to executive session for the purposes of oh, discussing cold, yeah. a superintendent evaluation with Dr. Cops. If there is a motion to do so, reading the action statement again, please. Somebody else want to do it? You're getting so good at oh, it. Oh, I'm so good. How long do you want? Um, Ten minutes. Ten. I move that the board go into executive session to discuss personnel matters pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception under coma and that mm -hmm. the open meeting shall resume at... 8.30 in the boardroom and that Dr. Cobbs be invited. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Passes 6 0. Right, how much time do we have left? Are we on time? Yeah. Are we going to resume? You have one minute. Okay. Well, I'll actually wait till everybody gets seated maybe before I. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yep. Who are your very similar events? Yeah. Madam President, I move that we come back into open session. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. That passes 6 0. Uh, you all have been, been provided with the personnel report. Is there a motion to approve the personnel report as presented? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. That passes 6 0 as well. Um, we are down to announcements. Uh, just a couple of things. Remember that uh, only three days in this week, uh, Thursday and Friday, are both PD days for us. Um, Mr. Robinson, Ms. Bybee, and I will all be gone beginning tomorrow afternoon. We're going to leave here probably around 3 o'clock to go to Chicago uh, to accept the Cognia Values Driven Award um, from our accreditation uh, group. And ultimately, this is about being a, a bold and innovative school district, um, which is a, a, another opportunity for us to, um, to validate some of the experiences that we've had here. First Friday is this Friday at Neosho County Community College. I've not heard who, um, who is the speaker yet, um, but we'll go and, and they'll tell us, I'm sure. Uh, and then something that was awesome, and, and again, I don't know that we can overstate what um, Mrs. Steinbaugh has provided to Ottawa High School. But she put a group of kids together to participate in Night at the Lab, um, and they were ultimately the regional winners and will now participate in state contests. Ms. Whitaker, you want to? They came in every morning for three weeks at 6.15 in the morning and prepared for that. They met her every morning for three weeks at 6.15 in the morning and prepared for that. Wow. Wow. So, those three, Alden, Quincy, and Riley, all congratulations to them. They'll be moving on to the state competition November 18th and 19th at KU Med. Uh, and then, of course, um, postseason began this weekend. I believe volleyball is now out of competition. Soccer won tonight 10 0 in the sleet. Uh, so they will play again. Do they play again tomorrow? Tomorrow. Uh, 
Uh, and then football is is Paola this weekend. At uh, Paola? Yeah. At Paola. Okay. okay. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. Passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank you.